What I'm going to do here is really just talk about the referendum as, as an aspect of our system. Uh, and uh, I'll have very little to say about the voice until the very end. Um, we don't really have a template for what um, we're going through at the moment for, for a number of reasons. One was mentioned earlier, Mark, I think, or somebody anyway, um, and that was about the social media aspect, um, that, that um, the last referendum was 1999. Um, I'm not including same-sex marriage um, survey there. It wasn't obviously a referendum in the sense that we're talking about here. So uh, there was no social media. Uh, perhaps a more fundamental issue, of course, is that the party system in Australia has decayed um, in striking ways that were utterly unpredictable, I think, in the 1990s. Uh, that the decline of lifelong voting, uh, the loosening hold of the major political parties on people's votes. I mean, at the last election, the, the, the electorate basically divided, you could say, three ways. You know, there was the Labor bit and there was the Coalition bit and there were the, the independents and the minor parties, um, uh, which, of course, had never happened before in the House of Representatives to have such a... Uh, an, a fairly equal division, if you like, between those three parts. So um, what does the, the, you know, the lack of bipartisanship mean uh, in a referendum context in, in 2023 compared with a period where, you know, the, the major political parties corralled, you know, 95%, 97% of the vote sometimes, okay? So we are in, in a, a different situation. Um, so let me just talk a bit about the, the history of the referendum. Um, so the, the referendum as an aspect of our constitution is indebted to the Swiss constitution. You can see there, um, majority of voters, majority of cantons in, in the Swiss case. The idea of, or the concept of a referendum as a way of um, resolving uh, particularly deadlocks between uh, two chambers of parliament had been around in the 19th century particularly in a Victorian context, which had a, essentially a dysfunctional um, uh, parliamentary system uh, with a, um, a very democratic, really, uh, legislative assembly and a, an extremely undemocratic uh, legislative council. And it led to two major constitutional crises, one in the mid-1860s and one in the late-1870s. And so the referendum uh, as a way of resolving deadlocks was often touted by liberals and, and radicals, in fact, during... Uh, that period and, and, and subsequently. But in the context of the formation of uh, the Australian Commonwealth and as a way, a means of changing the constitution, it really entered the draft constitution of the Adelaide Convention of 1897, one of the three that were held in that period. Um, the compromise uh, came out of the Premier's Conference of 1899 after the failure to get uh, a sufficient vote uh, in New South Wales to pass uh, a federation, to get, to get a, a federal bill through. Uh, the compromise was that a proposal for a referendum need only pass a single house in order to go to the people. Very interesting concession in a federal system, I think, because it basically meant that uh, a vote of the House of Representatives would be sufficient. So um, the Senate, you know, could not block a government that was determined that a, a, a question would go to a referendum. So a very interesting compromise that came out of uh, the Premier's conference held in 1899 to try and get this through. As we know, another very important compromise was that our, uh, the, uh, the capital would be in New South Wales, more than 100 miles away, and here we are. Uh, that was another one coming out of that. So um, this is a figure that uh, is very widely known. Um, you know, you could argue that we perhaps don't know enough about our political history generally, but one figure that seems to be very widely known is that eight of 44 uh, uh, propositions have passed. So it's a pretty uh, dismal record, I think it would be fair to say. Uh, there are the eight. Uh, I'm obviously not going to go into all those in, in great detail. Um, but um, I think it would be fair to say that, on the whole, they have been at the margins of our constitution. Uh, the most significant of them, I would suggest, uh, was probably not uh, in, in, in terms of its substance. I mean, I, I agree that 1967 was important symbolically. In terms of substance, I would have thought it was a couple of those uh, early financial ones that, that turned out to be extremely important for the way we're governed. 
But uh, you can see there that three of the eight succeeded on a single day in May 1977 under the Fraser government, not widely known. A fourth one uh, failed, and I'll get on to that one in a moment because that's a spooky one for, for uh, the present, and I'll, I'll talk about the one that failed that day shortly. Um, but you can see it's a pretty poor record on, on the whole, um, and, you know, I, I think broadly speaking it's often been matters um, that, that have been, you know, perhaps at the margins of the way we're governed. I mean, it's probably a good thing that judges, you know, can't be uh, sitting on the High Court at the age of 107. I don't wish to be ageist either. But, um, you know, uh, on the whole, it's perhaps not at the heart of our constitutional system. But nonetheless, uh, there you have them. Okay. Um, now, these are um, the five that got majorities but not double majorities. Um, five failed despite getting more than 50% of the vote. And I particularly draw your attention to that rather frightening one at number four. Simultaneous elections in 1977. So this is one of the four propositions that the Fraser government put to the people. I think all four had bipartisan support. Whitlam was leader of the opposition at that stage, on his last legs, of course, as leader of the opposition. And you can see there's 60, over 62% of the vote, uh, but it went down. 3-3. Three, three. Um, the Whitlam government had attempted, it kind of gets a bit meta, as the young people would say, or postmodern. The, 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 the Whitlam government had put up a proposition to allow a proposition to get up with a 3-3 three, three state result, which had failed at a, at a referendum during the Whitlam years. But you can see there that, uh, you know, you can get a very, very large majority, particularly if you get up New South Wales and Victoria, which is course, what has happened there, plus South Australia, and still it goes down. Broadly speaking, I think we have to say that the need for double majorities has actually not been a major barrier to constitutional change. I mean, it, we've got five instances, but I mean, look, at, you know, we do have that very extreme case uh, in uh, 1977 that I think should alert us to a danger. Remember, there'll probably be a lot of yes votes in this territory. I don't know. The Northern Territory the same, I guess? I don't know. I don't know about the situation there. But they will simply add to the yes vote without having any effect whatsoever on the double majority required, that the four out of six states. Um, here are some ambitious failures, uh, uh, which I'll talk briefly about again. Uh, 1911 was of great importance. I mean, uh, Australia would have probably had a different kind of political economy if Labor had got that up, the Fisher government in 1911. Uh, you can see there, to extend Commerce powers over a whole range of areas, commerce, control of corporations, Labor and employment. So that would have given the Parliament direct control over wages, something which uh, it did not have. Um, and, and on it goes. Combinations, monopolies, uh, but it only got... Uh, a bit over 39%. That's a, a party that had won two... but It, it had won a double majority at the 1910 election, uh, a Senate and a, and a House majority. Um, and, and a second proposition about monopolies, to give the power of the Commonwealth to nationalise monopolies. Uh, oh, sorry, that's wrong. That should be 39. Sorry, that's my mistyping. 39.89%. Only Western Australia got it up. There's a very interesting um, uh, story of WA often voting for more centralised Commonwealth power. And I'll come to another example of that in a moment. Um, so, sorry, yes, that should be 39, not 19. It wasn't that bad. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that, that's an example of an ambitious failure. Bipartisanship, interesting idea. Um, one of the things that happened here was division in the Labor Party. So, absolutely critical to this failure, certainly to the very low yes vote, was that uh, William Holman, uh, led a revolt in New South Wales. Um, he wasn't Premier, but was the, you know, the dynamic figure in the New South Wales Labor government, and he basically opposed this on state rights. So in that case, a division in the Labor Party uh, amounted to a kind of, uh, um, well, not lack of bipartisanship, but certainly to political division. 1913 was much closer, um, uh, despite Labor actually losing that election. And you can see there, all of the propositions are separated out, um, you can see in a way that they hadn't been in 1911, and you can see very close indeed uh, in terms of the majorities, and it was a 3-3. So, again, uh, a rather closer proposition. I'm calling these ambitious failures because these, these you know, were, were major... These were really Labor's attempt to 
influence a constitution that it had been excluded from being able to influence during the period of its formation in the 1890s, because Labor wasn't yet sufficiently organised or powerful enough to be elected to things like constitutional conventions. So this is the Labor Party now much more empowered, a decade on, 15 years on, attempting to change the constitution, to change the nature of that settlement. It largely failed. Um, and of course, this is the, probably the most ambitious failure of them all. Uh, this is 1944, the 14 powers referendum. Uh, it, they were grandfathered. It was only supposed to be for five years after the end of hostilities. Um, Stuart McIntyre has discussed the very complex history of this proposal. It really was a, a referendum in 1944 that only occurred because the, the uh, federal government, the Curtin government, had been unable to persuade the states to hand over the various powers. Um, it got some cooperation from New South Wales, but not from terribly, uh, um, uh, well, not really from other places. Um, and there you can see that very odd, uh, um, you know, they're supposed to be separatist and different and all the rest of it, but WA voted for this one, um, as did South Australia. Uh, and uh, I mean, in some ways a respectable result, but of course also absolutely critical in uh, the uh, mobilisation of the forces that led to the, the formation of the modern Liberal Party, uh, this particular proposition. Um, so that's 44. Um, and I'm going to sort of finish around the, the, a couple of points here around what I'm calling images of society. Now, these are half-formed ideas at this stage, and I offer them tentatively. Um, and what I'm suggesting is that, you know, often what's being argued over in these referendum uh, controversies is, you know, what, what kind of society are we? What kind of society do we have at the moment? And what kind of society do we need? That's, that's kind of, that, that's really the dynamic in, in I think, you know, a lot of the, the, these more ambitious ones, the ones I'm calling ambitious failures. I think that was certainly true of 1911-13, to a lesser extent 1919, which was, you know, Billy Hughes' uh, residual socialism and continuing authoritarianism at play, because he, he tried getting uh, power over a whole range of areas too. You can kind of see why the Conservatives eventually got rid of him. Um, but you, you can see that, the, you know, the, the, the sort of proposition, particularly for 1911 and 13, was the idea that the producing class, workers, manufacturers, farmers, uh, were, being, were, were a class that was being exploited by monopolies and rings and trusts and combines. It has a slightly conspiratorial feel, really, um, but also a response, obviously, to the, the you know, monopoly capitalism. So it was based on a particular image of society, of what was wrong, if you like, with Australia of uh, you know, 1910, 11, 13, and indeed coming out of the First World War. 1944... Um, the, the image is of uh, an economic order, um, and, you know, this is the Curtin government in power, an economic order that would produce another depression. Remember, they fear another depression. There was a kind of received wisdom that depressions followed wars, probably coming out of the Napoleonic Wars, I imagine, and after 1815. Uh, so an economic order would produce another depression and continuing instability and misery without enhanced federal power. I think that's the kind of argument that underpinned the 14 powers that I just had up. Um, and it's rejected, okay? So by 1944, for instance, to take that as the example here, a majority of voters basically say, no, we think that the federal government has sufficient power. We think it has sufficient power to do what needs to be done to ensure that we don't return to the miseries of the 1930s, okay? Uh, to ensure that we, uh, you know, don't have that kind of economic instability that we saw in that period. And you can kind of see why. Because in, by 1944, the federal government was empowered. It had used particularly the defence power to gain control of a whole range of areas of Australian life that had been unthinkable. Within days, they were able to get controls over banking that had eluded the Stalin government all the way through the Depression. Okay, so... Um, you can kind of see why, why voters might have thought uh, about uh, these propositions in, in, in the way they did. So can we think of them perhaps as rejected images? And, of course, counter-narratives emerged around these propositions. So in 1911, the states' rights narrative, as well as the anti-socialist uh, narrative coming from the, the uh, non-Labor side of politics. And certainly in 1944, a kind of anti-socialism, regimentation was the word that was often 
trotted out. You know, um, the the uh, Curtin government, Labor government, wants to produce a regimented society. So you know that that kind of, if you like, counter counter narrative for. Uh, the image of society that the government was, was was attempting to uphold in those particular referendum campaigns. So this um, this is the bit where I just want to very briefly turn to the voice and how we might um, use what I've been talking about to illuminate um, the, uh, the the issues that we face at the moment. Using that concept of images of society, let me begin with um, Indigenous Australia. And I've just put up a, a, a quotation there from... Uh, our story, it's called, which has been controversial. This is apparently the hidden sealed section of the, you know, the Uluru Statement. I mean, so I, I found it. And many of you know how incompetent I am at finding things on the internet. I found it. I found it. Look, there it is. I found it. Um, the, the point I want to make here, and I've, I've got a piece coming out in uh, Journal of Australian Studies based on a public lecture. Uh, coming, it comes out in a couple of months. Um, that. You know, deals with this argument in more detail. But let me just put it to you. The extraordinary diversity um, uh, that we're seeing in this particular understanding of Australia, so not, not the idea of Aboriginal Australia, not the idea of in, Indigenous Australia, but the idea of First Nations in, in all its diversity. And of course, the, the famous IATSIS map, building on earlier maps, uh, uh, you know, dramatises, I think, that sense of diversity. Of course, it uses a very familiar, legible national map in order to, to convey that diversity. Um, that diversity somehow has to be represented in a particular institution, a voice to parliament, that would necessarily be national, even while backed by regional organisation. And that's, that's a, a challenge, surely. Um, Stan Grant, um, a Wiradjuri man, journalist, explored the paradox in an article not very long ago, Many of his own people, he reported, were telling him that they didn't understand the voice. Uh, these people live close to the earth and the voice conversation, like all things of politics, feels distant, he wrote. Uh, the impression Grant leaves here, I think, is that the abstractions of formal politics are in tension with a Wiradjuri identity embedded in intimate knowledge of and connection with country. Wiradjuri people are rebuilding our nation, he explained. That's the Wiradjuri nation, right? Um, we are reviving our language and practising our ceremonies. One old uncle had told Grant that he doesn't want Indigenous people from outside our nation speak for us. Okay, the nation here is, is Wiradjuri. The terrain here seems to me a quite different one from the famous referendum of 1967, um, when more than nine in every ten Australians voted to change their constitution. We're now in an environment when arguments over sovereignty cannot be easily avoided. Um, what are the respective claims of Wiradjuri sovereignty against those asserted through British rule? Um, we have coexisted as First Nations on this land for at least 60,000 years, our story declares in the Referendum Council report. Our sovereignty pre-exists the Australian state and has survived it. The unfinished business of Australia's nationhood includes recognising the ancient jurisdictions of First Nations law. Will the voice lead to treaty? What about our sovereignty, asked Stan Grant, in his efforts to channel the feelings and confusions of his fellow Wiradjuri? I'd argue these are expressions of a new political geography in Australia. Um, they're also products of the tensions inherent in the settler colonial project since its inception in the 18th century. What we're seeing here is not the kind of breakup of Australia that you know, the wind shuttles and quadrants and all the rest of it have been predicting for years. Rather, we're seeing the resurgence of the claims of a legal pluralism that historians have found in the very foundation of British Australia in 1788. They've shown that sovereignty in early Australia did not function like a kind of blanket covering all people and territory from the moment the invaders planted the flag and declared it operational. Rather, sovereignty came in a more gradual, contingent, negotiated and partial manner as people and land were brought within its scope through the operation of the law. The dominant settler narrative, however, remains of a singular national law under a singular sovereignty, um, a position um, we need, I think, to remind ourselves that was actually asserted in the Mabo decision of 1992, even while it recognised native title. So the lived reality of Australia today is of the survival and resurgence of First Nations, law, sovereignty. Um, it involves an assertion, as we've heard today, of unceded sovereignty, that law was violated 
by the coming of the British to Australia, this truth needs to be told, declares our story. So, where does that leave the voice? These are not so much conclusions as random thoughts, really, and rather unconnected and offered very tentatively. Um, the first of them is the thought that um, one of the, the, the images, I'm going back to that concept of images of Australia, and I think there is a certain image of Australia that people, are voters, are invited to uh, um, accept uh, within the current uh, yes discourse. And that, that is of uh, a population that is Indigenous, non-Indigenous, that is First Nations and settler. Now, I'm not criticising that particular image, but we need to recognise this is, as Mark said earlier, this is politics, this is political discourse. Is it a convincing image of Australia for the overwhelming majority of voters? We'll find out, perhaps. Um, what I would, I suppose, offer as a part answer to that, is where did multiculturalism go and what is the relationship between that image that I've got up the top there and the multicultural image of Australia. When I was wandering around um, uh, Haymarket in Sydney yesterday, uh, intuitively I saw something that I think many Australians would say, this is multicultural Australia. That's its variety. And they, they'd say, you know, they're not being prescriptive, they're being dis descriptive. They'd say, oh look, here's multicultural Australia. Can they do the same with the first? Well, yes, probably, if they can be persuaded. And that's what politics is all about. Um, I think there's a deep, um, uh, deeply embedded idea within Australian uh, political culture, democratic political culture, if you want to call it that, that equality means treating everybody the same. Um, Peter just referred to the mid-'80s. I mean, I look you know, quite closely at the debates over national land rights. 84, 85, and it's such a powerful um, kind of objection that was offered by politicians, by uh, um, yeah, various entrenched interests, and with great effect because it defeated the attempt uh, to, 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 um, to legislate for national land rights. This idea that, it, that there was something fundamentally unequal about providing land rights, and in the case of The Voice, providing an institution um, to a particular group. And we, we have to accept that this is an argument that needs to be made within the politics of The Voice. Why that needs to be done, how will be um, a better democracy rather than somehow a, um, a poorer one for actually doing that. Um, I think there is a strong majoritarian uh, 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 ethic within Australian democratic culture, although of course it is tempered by federalism, a point that I think Shireen Morris has made uh, in defence of the voice, arguing, well, you know, you can think of the voice as sort of broadly in line with a kind of federal constitution. The federal constitution recognises that Tasmania preserves as many senators as New South Wales, because that's federalism, that's preserving minorities. Well, the voice, even though only advisory, of course, can be defended on the same principle. It's, it's broadly in line. It doesn't, it's not at right angles, if you like, to a federal constitution. It's a very powerful, interesting argument, although not one I think we've heard much of in the actual debate. Um, the idea of Australia as a Benthamite society has been an important part of uh, debate around democracy in Australia. Uh, this is... Uh, Bain Atwood talks about this in his article... One of the arguments that's been uh, constantly put, Albanese puts a lot, is vote for the voice, it'll help close the gap. That's a classic utilitarian or Benthamite version of Australian democracy. Are people buying it? We'll see. Um, there's the imaginary grandstand aspect of our democratic political culture. The whole world is watching us. Well, if you believe that, you can. Uh, they're not. They're not. Um, the British people are worried at the moment that the concrete in their schools are going to fall on their children's heads. Um, they're probably not. I mean, this is Graham Davison's idea, and of course he's sceptical of it. He, he points to the number of occasions where this kind of discourse has been used, 1956 Olympics being an example, and the world wasn't watching. Right? So um, it, it's a part of the debate. Again, is it going to persuade people? Um, we don't know. But I offer it again as another question about this particular debate. Will people be persuaded that they need to vote this way because the world will judge us harshly if we vote that way? 
Um, we also, and this is my last point, um, we need to be wary too of what it all means in the end. We don't know which way this is going to go. I mean, um, there are pessimists, there are optimists. But the, the mythologising has already begun, hasn't it, about what it all means. Now, um, does it mean something fundamentally different if 50.1% uh, 50, uh, 50 vote yes and 49.9% vote no from the other way around? If this referendum does get a yes vote, does that mean that Australia now can cease to think of itself as a racist country or a country with a legacy of racism? Of course not. But that mythologisation is already happening and perhaps it's an inevitable and maybe even useful part of political debate in attempting to, to, to get this proposal up. But I, we're historians, right? So we need also to be able to deconstruct that. And I just offer, I mean, we know there's a whole literature, isn't there, around 1967. There are still some people who think it's about, it was about giving Indigenous people the vote. Uh, 1988 is a classic. Now, that went down. Oh, did it go down? It went down really badly, a whole a miscellaneous collection of propositions from the Hawke government. So does that mean, because that happened, that Australians object to freedom of religion and fair voting? Well, surely not. OK? Surely not. So we need to be careful what we conclude. And of course, the same with 1999. Australians vote to retain the monarchy. Well, kind of. Kind of. We know about the complexities of that debate. So I guess what the note I can clue on here is simply to make the point that um, there will be an after the referendum, whether it's a yes or a no, and that as historians we have a deep responsibility to actually, not to mythologise, but to actually explain and to analyse. Um, and to, to be aware, I think, that, you know, uh, numbers running this way and that way, while significant, don't necessarily point to the kinds of definite conclusions that mythologisers would like them to point to. So I'll finish there. Thanks.